This is Earth. Right now, Earth has a problem. A problem caused by one of its more successful hominid species, us. And the problem is called climate change. You've probably heard this story before. Humans, primarily through the burning of fossil fuels and other industrial activities, have managed to increase the levels of greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and methane in Earth's atmosphere to levels not seen in 800,000 years or more. As a result, the average global temperature is rising and we are feeling the effects. Stronger storms, more intense droughts and rain, etc. Disruptions to how we run cities and grow food are expected. It is going to be very uncomfortable, to say the least. However, the more extreme changes are expected to transform places like Antarctica, the frozen, penguin-laden continent down at the bottom of the planet. And that's not good, because Antarctica acts as a kind of keystone for the global climate system. If even a quarter of that ice melts, well, it's going to be a bad time for everyone. But more than that, the polar regions have value for us humans right now. Value that we can see and measure. And it's a lot more than you might think. Here's someone who can spell it out for us. Yeah, my name is James McClintock. I am the endowed university professor of polar and marine biology at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Dr. McClintock is a marine biologist and chemical ecologist who has worked in Antarctica for decades. He is the author of Lost Antarctica and A Naturalist Goes Fishing. His work down at the bottom of the planet exemplifies why we should care about far-off frozen places. It turns out the creatures living in Antarctic waters represent a unique evolutionary context, a context that might have a direct impact on your health one day. But first, let's discuss just how polar regions like Antarctica are being threatened by global changes. Just what is going on down there? So where I'm working on the Antarctic Peninsula is one of the most rapidly warming regions of our planet. One of the things that's happening is the glaciers uh, up and down the western Antarctic Peninsula are receding. The other thing that's happening that's really been all over the news lately is the ice sheets are breaking up. In the last 30 years, about eight major breakouts uh, have occurred. So this, is, this isn't good news because while the ice that melts from these ice sheets doesn't contribute to sea level rise, it turns out that these ice sheets are barriers to the flow of ice off the continent. So we're looking at 60 to 70 percent of the fresh water of the planet locked up in that ice. And that ice does contribute to our predictions for sea level rise. So what's going on in Antarctica right now with the ice sheets and the movement of that ice into the sea could play into whether we have three feet of sea level rise by the end of the century or six feet. Um, big, big impacts in that sense. And then the marine life itself is being impacted. Uh, perhaps the most poignant story being the, the Adelie penguin, which is disappearing because its colonies are being covered with a very unseasonably late snowstorm and the eggs are drowning. And uh, they're also having trouble because the sea ice supports krill populations that live under it. And as the sea ice breaks up, there's not as much food up and down the food webs for baleen whales, for seals, for penguins and fish and all these things. With warming, we're also seeing the potential of movements of predators into the seafloor ecosystem that haven't been there in the past. And the one that I've been personally studying are king crabs that have lived in the deep sea for millions of years. And now as the Antarctic circumpolar deep water currents are beginning to warm, um, we believe that the physiological constraints that have kept the king crabs from coming up the slope and getting onto the shelf are essentially being relieved. And that's not good news if you're an organism that's lived in the shallow seafloor communities of Antarctica. Um, they could really be decimated by these crushing predators. They have very few protective devices against them. Okay, so that's a lot to worry about, sure. Melting ice, sea level rise, threats to Adelie penguins, and the impending march of the king crabs. But what is so special about the ecosystems found in Antarctic waters? Why should we care? 
So the Antarctic seafloor, the shelf that surrounds Antarctica, is remarkable in its biodiversity. In terms of the amount of marine organisms, the sheer biomass of marine organisms, we're talking about something that's comparable to the Great Barrier Reefs of Australia. I mean, this is one of the richest marine ecosystems anywhere. And it's a very ancient ecosystem. So there's been a lot of time for diversification to occur. You can have very rich abundances of different species of crustaceans and sponges and soft corals. And this also plays into this, the, the, the chemical diversity that I'm interested in as a chemical ecologist. Evolutionary pressures between species can sometimes involve a chemical dimension. A variety of molecular compounds have been deployed by species to assist in defense, compounds that have evolved specific targets and specific tasks over millions of years. This is especially true in the waters of Antarctica, where ecosystems have been relatively isolated for tens of millions of years. So there is a tremendous diversity of chemicals that we've found in our chemical ecology work over the last 25 years that serve these various defensive functions to increase the survival of the organisms that live on the seafloor. So how do these evolved chemical defenses pertain to our lives way up here in the warmer parts of the planet? Well, one aspect of Dr. McClintock's work involves that of drug discovery. Their team submits compounds that they collect to organizations and companies that are interested in examining those compounds for their potential effects on bacteria and disease. The National Cancer Institute, the Cystic Fibrosis Research Center at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, and various pharmaceutical companies are interested in looking at compounds that have naturally evolved to see if something useful can be found. But one discovery that we had recently that is very exciting is we found a chemical in a sponge, an Antarctic sponge. The, name of, the scientific name of the sponge is Dendrilla membranosa. Um, some people call it the cactus sponge. Dendrilla membranosa has a chemical that we found to be very, very active uh, against the uh, biofilm form of MRSA. MRSA or methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, is a bacteria increasingly prevalent in hospitals. It has evolved a serious resistance to antibiotics and is notoriously difficult to treat. MRSA can exist in two forms. It can exist in liquid, in an aqueous form, or it can exist on a surface. Um, when it's on a surface, it's called a biofilm. And a biofilm is made up of mucus and proteins and different kinds of things. And imagine that this bacteria is hidden under the biofilm. Well, to date, thousands of compounds have been tested to try and treat MRSA that's in the biofilm form with no success. And this compound that we found in Dendrilla membranosa, this Antarctic sponge, is the first one that penetrates the biofilm and actually has some activity against MRSA. You go in, you're a surgeon, you replace a knee with a titanium replacement. Your patient develops the biofilm form of MRSA on the surface of that titanium. You treat the patient with antibiotics, no luck. You have to take the implanted knee out of the patient. You may treat them then, they may have to be treated four, five, six weeks to try and get them clear of this bacterial infection while they're sitting there with no knee. And then you have to replace the surgical implant. I mean, this is happening now in 10, 15, up to 20% of their surgeries. This is a big deal. What we're hoping to do now with this compound, which uh, we have named Darwinolide. Darwinolide has to be produced in the laboratory to have any potential for the future. We can't go to Antarctica with big ships and harvest hundreds of kilograms of sponges from the seafloor. First of all, it's not environmentally acceptable. Second of all, it wouldn't be financially practical. We do know that the next step will be to produce darwinolide in the laboratory. 99% of things can be made by chemists in the lab now, so we're confident that that can be done. What one would hope is that it can be done with a minimum number of steps so that it's not terribly expensive, the process of producing it. And then the thing to do would be to see if you can alter the chemistry of darwinolide a little bit. What, what you're trying to do is increase the activity of it, to, to increase its potency against the bacteria. Right now, its potency is borderline good, you know, good to very good. It needs to be excellent. And that's where combinatorial chemistry comes in. You can take a compound and you can change it a little bit, and maybe that would increase its potency. But perhaps the 
biggest thing about darwinolide is its ability to move through a biofilm. And apparently just understanding how it's doing that could be tremendously important in coming up with a whole new class of compounds that are effective against things that are embedded in biofilms. Finding such a helpful chemical compound existing free in the wild is really incredible. But it isn't the end of the process. It's only the beginning. Since darwinolide cannot be harvested, it must be synthesized in a lab. And it has to be tested, first on mice and then eventually on humans. And this process isn't quick or cheap. It cost billions of dollars to get drugs from discovery to the market. And with that much money involved, there certainly has to be demand. And the demand for darwinolide is there. The threat that MRSA represents is known throughout the medical community. However, despite the high cost, none of this would be possible without the millions of years of evolution that produced darwinolide. What we're getting from the natural environment is millions of years of evolution of a chemical that if we didn't find it in nature, we probably would never stumble across creating it in the laboratory. But when we find these things, the beauty of this is they become models for something that we can produce in the laboratory. And darwinolide isn't even the only drug to come out of the waters of Antarctica. Dr. McClintock's chemical ecology group has also discovered a rather useful chemical compound found in a tunicate. Um, well, these tunicates that we found in Antarctica are bright orange and uh, they're everywhere, very common. As we do routinely, we took uh, a compound that we found in the tunicate. We named it after the station we work at, Palmer Station. We named it Palmerolide. Palmerolide was sent off to the National Cancer Institute. Uh, routine screening against 25 different cell lines of human cancer. We got a phone call from the National Cancer Institute and they said, we're really excited about Palmerolide. It's very potent against only one of the types of cancer that we screened it against. And one of the things that you look for in a cancer drug is specificity. You, you like something that's focused on a particular type of cancer. And the National Cancer Institute said to our Antarctic Chemical Ecology Group, um, we want to work on this chemical, can we? And when the National Cancer Institute asks you if they can work on something, you say, yes! When I give my climate change talk, this is the example I always share with my audience about why we should care about squandering the seafloor communities of Antarctica. I mean, we don't have very many drugs to fight melanoma. I mean, the arsenal is very limited and there is certainly a demand for that. I think this is just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, you start to look at melanoma, compounds, anti-melanoma compounds, you look at anti-MRSA compounds. The Antarctic seafloor is a treasure chest of potential drugs. And so, again, this gets back to this whole question of how do you value the loss of something in human terms? Um, and certainly in terms of what we're doing with climate in Antarctica, we have to think about the bigger picture. It's not just the cute penguins that might be disappearing, it's uh, answers to our own health. Thank you for watching. If you like this, then you should really consider checking out Dr. McClintock's books, Lost Antarctica and A Naturalist Goes Fishing, the links for both of which can be found in the subspace below. Also, check out our previous interview with Dr. McClintock right here. It is about a most unusual kind of parasitism, one that involves a chemical surprise. Thanks.